Hi everyone, hope you're doing really well today and welcome to open class. I'll start with our usual disclaimer. Nothing that we'll talk about here today is specific or medical advice, just general thoughts and comments that I hope will be really valuable to you and whoever wrote to us. Of course, we have six messages to go over today. And uh, I will say that, um, you know, this channel is like the, the, the what, what brings life to this channel is the comment section and open class, like questions from the community. That's, that's where it all started and, you know, it's so valuable, so helpful. And I'm so grateful for everyone who is uh, willing to share their story and ask questions. Uh, the, the, the challenge right now is that I have a little bit of a hard time keep, keeping up with answering, you know, the questions that come in, come into open class, um, which is, you know, it's a kind of like a, one of those, it's a good problem to have, but it's still a little bit of a problem because, uh, I would like everyone to get a reply within, you know, a reasonable time frame, maybe a week or something like that. Sorry, let me silence my phone here. Um, so, um, so just to know that I'm working on this, and um, I uh, am actually soon going to announce that there will be some help uh, in within the school, uh, and maybe the person who's joining the school may be doing some open classes. That could be one solution. Um, maybe maybe we'll go to a format where we will just have a live, like be, be live here uh, and, you know, and you can have notifications so that you can join live and ask questions live uh, or something like that. Uh, but anyway, I just want you to know that I'm thinking a lot about this and um, I really want to try to answer all the questions that come in that I'm a little bit behind. All right. So with that said, let, let's jump in and, uh, and, and look at these questions so, I, so we don't get more behind. <laughs> okay. Let's take a look here. So again, six six people have sent us questions today and the first one is uh, uh rhubarb uh, who says hi coach daniel i need your help and it, is it possible to talk to you over the phone first about my situation and then we can decide a course of action please let me know i i, I don't do any type of like a phone console source anything like that and uh you know, but I completely understand this, that often it can seem like before I uh, join uh, the insomnia immunity program or bedtime, like I would like to know if this is something for me or not. Well, I think just spending some time on this channel learning about the teaching, that could be really helpful. Also, know that if you, if you download bedtime, it's a one week free trial that will give you a, really a sense of it's helpful for you. And within the insomnia immunity program, the self-coaching program uh, on, the, on the website, there's a 30 day free trial. So, you know, that, that, that could really help you. Okay. Uh, Rubab, um, hope that helps. So let's move on here to Sagi's question. Uh, Sagi says, that's odd. I'm, I literally just silenced this, isn't I? There. Okay. Sagi says, hi, Daniel, you already answered me in YouTube, but you asked me to send it to open class. So here it is. Uh, this was a comment and I think it was a very, you know, there was a lot of value in this comment that I thought would be helpful to review here. So anyway, since I found your channel, my sleep got much better. And that's that came due to education. Really, that's the foundation. Education is always the foundation. Now, I even wrote you a couple of times, but the last two nights were very hard. I slept for an hour and then I couldn't sleep again. I get frustrated and suddenly all my education just doesn't seem to help anymore. So I was looking for a video about speed bumps in your channel and found this one. I'm not sure exactly which one it is, uh, actually, but uh, there's a, actually a playlist on speed bumps, so probably one of those ones. Uh, so anyone interested in speed bumps, um, check out the playlist. It's in the description. There's a link to it in the description of any new video. Um, due to your education, I'm really less worried than I used to be, at least at the part that understanding that a few hours of sleep won't affect my health, but there are some things that do not... Uh, 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 that, that does not that aren't clear to me yet can you please clarify number one how do you break the speed bump cycle you haven't slept so you're already anxious when the night starts okay so very good question here and so a speed bump for anyone that's new to the channel is basically when you know you you've started to understand why you had trouble sleeping you see that it's like trying to sleep that makes you have trouble sleeping and you're kind of backing away from the struggle you're sleeping easier but despite that you understand what's happened, despite the learning education you have, you run into a situation where you again are having, uh, having again have trouble sleeping, like you're not sleeping much, et cetera. That's what, that's what I call a speed bump. And many people um, 
refer to it like as a relapse or like a setback. But in my opinion, th that can never happen really because relapse is something that happens if you have some kind of condition, like a medical condition, uh, uh, which insomnia isn't. Insomnia is just like a confusion. And a setback is, is something that uh, means that you went backwards, which you also cannot do because you cannot really forget things that you've learned. I mean, technically it's possible, but that's, you know, in, in the context of a speed bump, that's not what's happening. Um, it, so a speed bump is really simple. It's very simple. A speed bump is, is just that, okay, insomnia is driven by fear, the fear of being awake. What if I can't sleep? What if I'm awake all night, right? And when you learn and you, you realize, so oh, this is what's happening. It's all my trying, my efforts that's creating this. Then that fear starts to fade away and sleep comes easier. But guess what? If you've had this traumatic experience, then the, fa the fear isn't going to go down like in a linear and smooth way. There's going to be times when the brain for some reason goes, wait a minute, what if I'm missing something? Maybe something dangerous is happening. Maybe, maybe, this, maybe, this is, maybe I have a real problem, right? And that's when you have a speed bump. It's completely natural. The speed bump is completely natural, part of the process, nothing strange or unusual. Now, uh, here's the thing, though. Insomnia is a cycle of resistance. It can often start with something like uh, just a thought, like, what if I don't sleep tonight? Uh, or you or you slept a little one night, and you're like, what if it happens again? And this thought is kind of unpleasant because it, it's anxiety-provoking. So you resist this thought. You're like, but of course I'm going to sleep. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to sleep. And then, you know, the more you resist a warning signal from the brain, the stronger that, that signal becomes because the brain wants to warn you. It wants to keep you safe. So it pushes the, but what if you, what, what if this doesn't help? What if this doesn't work? And you're like, but I'm going to do this. But and then you, now you're fighting this thought. Now there's a resistance to this thought. This creates this like increasing struggle and more and more trouble sleeping, right? So insomnia is a cycle of resistance. The more resistance, the more trouble. Now, when you're asking, how can I break the cycle of a speed bump? You know, I'm starting to have trouble again. I'm in the speed bump. How can I break the speed bump cycle? That's also resistance. So the, the tricky thing here is to see that trying to break the cycle is the cycle. You know, trying to prevent having trouble sleeping, sleeping again is the resistance that causes trouble sleeping again. Okay. So that's the main teaching point here. Um, Jake, I let's sneak, sneak this one in since Jake is with us live here. Hi, Daniel, how are you? I'm happy to say that I don't need to watch your videos as I'm finally at that immunity stage. That's amazing. So happy to hear this, Jake. So nice to start living in real life again and leave the sleep world for good. Yeah, 100%. And you know, uh, that's amazing. I know you tune in a lot. You asked a lot of questions, Jake. You did so much learning and, and that's great. And you know, the only thing I want to add here is uh, thanks for sharing and also if you want to be a guest. If you want to be a guest at any point in the future, let me know. Super. That was so nice. So nice to hear that one. All right, let's go back to, to Sagi's, um, Sagi's questions. Number two, you have talked about gas and brakes. So what if the brake will always prevent me from sleeping, even if the gas is strong? Okay. Um, let's see. We have another live comment here. Uh, Sean Calcrell says, hi, Daniel, things are going as they should. Sleeping like a normal person. Some nights I take longer, but not a big issue. I still find difficulty taking a nap in the day. Very, very glad to read this, you know, and, um, you know, I think it's also important to say that, you, you know, anyone is a normal person, no matter how much struggle you have, no matter, it, it seems like this is crazy. This is bizarre. This is otherworldly. Like this could not be happening. This cannot be normal. It's just normal things happening. It's just a, a mind that is somewhat scared that's producing things too. So when you start seeing this, then you start sleeping well again, and it seems like you're a normal person again. But you were all the same person. There was just a little bit of confusion in the brain, right? Now, um, as for the naps, I want to say that oftentimes that hyper arousal, that state of kind of a little bit of fear, hyper vigilance, it doesn't go away kind of quickly or in a linear fashion, it's kind of a little bit of a bumpy way down. And oftentimes you find that there's still a little bit hyper arousal left. So you don't, it, you know, napping doesn't come easy to you, but you can always rest, you know, you can always rest if you feel like you need to rest. And then <clears throat> one day you will just happen to fall asleep and there you took a nap and then, you know, that's not there anymore. anymore. Um, and oh, in, in Shankal, as my insomnia episode started with afternoon naps. So there's an additional hyper arousal around naps. So I, I think the key is always to like, uh, not go in the direction of like, if I can't nap, something is wrong with me. If I can't nap, that means I haven't gotten over this. If I, if I can't nap, 
that's the problem. There's that's some resistance again. But when you go to towards like my song has started with something related to naps, so of course it's going to be a little tricky to nap because that's going to be there, and um, and the hype arousal is uh, going to fade over time. Exactly when we think what's happening to us is normal and we think it's nothing strange, it's demystified. Then the hype arousal fades, but not in any you know always good not to forecast. Is it going to take you know? In two weeks, I'm going to be like, you know, napping again, or it's going to be like in two months or in, 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 in longer, shorter, like it, 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 nobody knows. And the more you're like, it'll happen when it happens, then it happens sooner. If it's like, I'm counting, I'm waiting, I'm trying, I'm hoping, then it takes a little longer. So just like, that's, that's a really nice approach. And you've already seen what happens when you start letting go, Shankal, and keep letting go, keep letting it be like good things happen from that, from that place. So many nice things come. All right. Oh yeah. So um, the question from um, Soggy here was uh, on the gas and brake model. And what if the brake? So gas and brake model for everyone, anyone new to the channel, check out the playlist in the description of any new video called "This Is Nato," where we, where there's a video where we review the gas and brake model. Super helpful. I think it's a very very helpful thing to understand. Very briefly here, gas is sleep drive. The body's need to sleep, which only comes from wakefulness. If you're awake for a period of time, your body needs to sleep. And that creates a sleep drive. Now that sleep can be blocked by hyperarousal. A hyperarousal is kind of a safety mechanism. If you're about to fall asleep when uh, you left the oven on, you know, you wake up and you're like wide awake because it's not safe to wake up, right? That's gas and brake. The two things that determine sleep, really. Now, Saiga says, what if the gas is always super strong? What will happen then? You will sleep. <laughs> you will still sleep. But you may have what we call hypersleep or paradoxical insomnia or whatever you want to call it. You know, it's kind of like holding your breath. You can take it, you can hold your breath for a really long time, but not to a point where it can harm you. And eventually you just you just take that rescue breath. The same thing with sleep, like you can be awake for a long time, but eventually the body needs to sleep and it just uh, it just produces sleep. You just fall asleep. Now that said, if that hyper arousal is quite strong, if there's strong fear of being awake, uh, you know, uh, or, or something else is driving hyper arousal, then it can it may not feel like you slept. It can feel like you know you just time just skipped ahead, or you you're not sure you slept, or things of that nature. So when there's a lot of breaking going on, uh, then you know you may not feel like you slept, but that's totally normal and and um, and expected. So I think the key here is to know that even if you're very anxious or you're very anxious about sleep. Sleep always happens, like that always happens, but it's still like, it's when you see that there's nothing wrong with me, everything is normal, nothing is strange, etc. That's when you start feeling like, oh, I slept, I really slept this time, you know, something like that. Awais is here live with us. Nice meeting you. Uh, hi there, hope you're doing well. Okay, now to question number three from Sagi. Let's check this one out. When I sleep for three hours on a bad night, I say to myself, if it's enough for me, uh, and then I'm accepting uh, this, uh, it's not so hard. But what, what do you do when you only slept one hour, like last night? Then it's hard to accept awakening. You, you still enjoy being awake, but you worry about tomorrow. Yeah, this is a good one, which is basically like, okay, the, one of the key things I teach is this uh, concept of befriending wakefulness. Like insomnia comes from a place where the brain has started to think that being awake is a threat, danger, an enemy, something you got to escape or, or get rid of or fight. And so, uh, that, and that leads to insomnia, right? When we try not to be awake, we end up being awake. So, uh, so I teach this concept of befriending wakefulness, which is like uh, approaching being awake as just a neutral state of mind. Nothing that is scary or uh, nothing is scary is, a, is, a, is not a helpful way to put it. I should say nothing that is dangerous. It's nothing dangerous about being awake. You know, and we start treating being awake as a friend rather than a foe. It says it's okay to be awake. I can do something meaningful when I'm awake. Then a lot of pressure goes away and the fear subsides and sleep happens easier. But Sagi makes this comment that when, when I've slept even as little as like three hours, then, um, you know, the following night, it's, it's still okay. I can still go towards like it's okay if I'm awake. But if I only slept one hour or less, then it's very difficult for me to go into the fall and saying like it's okay to be awake because then the fear is really strong. What if it happens again? What if it happens three nights? What if it happens like that? What if I lose control? What if I go crazy? All these things happen then, right? So I, I think the key there is just 
to deploy awareness there to say that, of course, you know, for someone who generally hasn't had much struggle with sleep at all, right? And they have a little trouble and you say like, just try to like befriend wakefulness. They're gonna be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I can, I can do that pretty easily, right? But if you've not slept uh, at all, like there's been a really huge struggle and, and there was one particular night that we didn't sleep at all, then it is gonna be harder to, to be in a mindset where like, uh, it's okay to be awake. And the key there to, uh, to me is to see that it's totally normal to think that it's 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 very hard to befriend wakefulness. You know, there's nothing strange about that. And when you're thinking to yourself like, oh my gosh, I, I, I it's so hard for me to think of being awake as okay, then you can be like, of course, of course that's hard, you know? It, because it's when you think, I shouldn't think this way, it should be easy, I shouldn't make this such a big of a deal, why can't I? That's when you have trouble. But when you simply go, yeah, it, it is kind of hard for me and that's normal nothing strange with that, then a lot of pressure is gone, is, is, is gone and everything becomes a little easier. I think that's that's really the most helpful thing. Awais is with us from live, uh, live from Pakistan. Greetings from Pakistan. I'm 31 years old and suffering from insomnia since 12 years. Well, Awais, I'm so glad you're here and found the channel. I think you'll find a lot here that's gonna be really helpful to you. And Shankal says, thank you for your channel. It's been great understanding your philosophy. It's very scientific and makes so much sense. Have you read the <laughs> Bhagavad Gita? As it is, it is very much in line with thinking and, and the attachment and the intricacies of the mind. <laughs> That's a, I never had that question before and I've not read the Bhagavad Gita, but I, 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 I've remarked upon this when I get questions from uh, people from India, for example, or even from Japan, like, cause, cause I, I've learned a lot from like, you know, Buddhist teaching and like Zen Buddhism and things of that nature. And uh, you know, Bhagavad Gita, I think, has maybe has nothing to do with Buddhism, but that, but the, that area of the world, let's say, you know, the I think particularly from India, like a lot of the teaching comes from India. So it doesn't surprise me at all that what I teach here is very sim, very aligned with the Bhagavad Gita. Um, and uh, I, I should, I should get into. It. I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot. Uh, cool question. Um, I always says, I feel so drained every morning. I tried prescription medications like sleeping pills and prescribed medications, but nothing worked. I struggle every day at work and can't focus on everything. I think, um, you know, something that can really help here, uh, Awais, is um, there's a, there's a, if you, if you Google insomnia insight battle scars, you'll find it. I believe it's insomnia episode number 204. I, I don't, I don't want to say what it is, but it's, it's one of the, one of the episodes here where we talk about how, you know, the fatigue, the anxiety, like, you know, feeling nauseous, not having appetite, like tinnitus ringing in the ear, the pain, the itchy eyes, you know, the headache, the ringing and the, all that is what I call battle scars. And the tricky thing is that it often seems like that happens because I didn't sleep many hours, but that's actually not what causes it. So if you think about it, you can sleep very little, let's say you didn't sleep at all, but the following day, you know, you, you, get a random email that you won like $2 million and you're like feeling great in the instant. You're like, oh my gosh, this changes my life. And in that moment, you just feel amazing, refreshed, energized, right? It just shows that how much we slept has not that much impact on how we feel, but the struggle, trying to sleep, trying medications, trying to come off medications, trying supplements, trying, you know, this and that, and just always feeling like you failed, you couldn't make it happen because nobody can make it happen. It's impossible, right? But trying and trying and trying, failing and failing and failing, or feeling like you're failing, I should say, that creates this fatigue, this exhaustion, this emotional, deep-rooted inner fatigue, you know? And, the, and when you abandon the struggle and you go towards self-kindness and understanding, then you start feeling refreshed again, you know? So it's really all about abandoning the struggle there. And then your focus comes back and then, you know, everything's just lighter and brighter. Shankal says, I would like to send you a copy of the Bible. I, that, that was super nice, but you know, I'll just, uh, in these days, it's so easy. I'll just order it on uh, Amazon or something like that. And uh, I'll think of you, Shankal, when I read it. Lovely, okay. Let us hop into the fourth question from Sagi. The other thing I was thinking about well, was, I have all the knowledge and education I needed, but I can't sleep, so maybe it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, what will? And this leads you into more anxiety, which makes things even worse. Totally, totally, totally. Now, I think the, conf the, the idea here is, and then we read this actually in the earlier part of Sagi's message was that the education 
has helped me sleep. And, and the tricky thing there is that it can seem like, you know, uh, cause and effect. I learn, therefore I sleep. The learning made me sleep, which is not the case at all. <laughs> it was like education uh, taught you that you don't need to do anything to sleep and you did less and then you slept. And, you know, and the, but then when you have the speed bump again, you have some trouble sleeping and it's like, dang it, the education doesn't work anymore. But now you started becoming a little confused. You started to think that the education made you sleep, which it didn't at all. So it, 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 nothing works. You know, nothing can make you sleep. It's just literally impossible to, to, make, to make a human sleep or to make yourself sleep. So I think the key is just to see that education is just one way to do less and try less and, and not look for something that works, you know? So I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll leave it there and, and, and uh, continue on to our next uh, message. Um, okay, Andrew says, Hi, Daniel. I've had insomnia for around 17 years. It is no doubt caused by anxiety, depression, etc. But each time I sleep, I sleep short windows. I've intense dreams where I feel as if I've been asleep for weeks, yet may have slept 15 minutes. It has crippled my life, and I have no idea of how to control it. Thank you for your time. Andrew, you know, thanks so much for being here. Sorry to hear this has been going so very long. And uh, one of my guests said here, like, uh, what was the name? It was Leighton. Leighton uh, was the guest, and he said that, you know, many people who have insomnia have almost like an insomnia birthday. Like, you know, you almost know exactly the date when it started. And then every year it's like, now it's been a year, now it's been two years. And, you know, reading that it was 17 years, it, it reminds me of that, how you keep track of how long it's been going on, which is very natural, but also tells, it tells us a lot, you know, when we keep track of something and we monitor it and we wonder and we ponder that really fuels the struggle. So that's just a random idea. And, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for me to say, like, just abandon the struggle, which is, so it's not it's tricky it's very tricky but just having the awareness that attention fuels the struggle or attention is the struggle really can be helpful or another way to put it is that um it is not so much how was this put again uh, you, you put it this way that um insomnia cannot exist it, it just cannot exist without something keeping it going if you will and what's keeping it going, ironically, is trying to make it stop, you know, trying to get away from it, trying to find the cure, the solution, you know. And, and, and when, you, when, when you're no longer looking for that, it just, it's nothing. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know why I went in that direction kind of randomly here, but I hope that made some sense, Andrew. But now, you know, more specifically here, we have the same, I actually we have something similar in the way this was asked, which was, uh, I have no idea how to control it. And, you know, when you hear that, it just it just says so much because uh, when you sleep well, it, it really is because there's no attempt at all to control anything. And it can be confusing because it can look like other people, they have some control. Or 18 years ago, before this started, I had some control, but I lost it and I can't find it again. And it's the looking for control is the cycle, is insomnia. And uh, when you see that oh, other people have no control, whatsoever but they're not trying to control anything either then you can see that aha uh -huh, okay it is the it is the trying to find control that is the struggle you can more easily sort of like leave any attempts at trying to have control and then peace of mind happens peaceful sleep happens so i think that was that was the main one here but oh yeah yeah the other one so um they can often one very common question is like uh is there something wrong with the type of sleep I'm getting? You know, I don't even know if I have insomnia or maybe something is wrong with my sleep. I think it can be helpful to know that if you do like an EG, like you study like the brain waves of, of people who have insomnia or not, like you cannot tell the difference uh, by virtue of EG. Like uh, it just it, it just looks the same. And um, there's nothing wrong with like the quality or type of sleep you have like when you have insomnia it's not about that it rather it's about believing something is wrong of course that drives a lot of hyper arousal and fear um and and specifically this can lead to this what i call hypersleep which is um we talked earlier in this episode about the gas and brake model which is basically when you're 
when you have a sleep drive, your body needs to sleep, but you're also like very uh, worried about not sleeping. And you're sort of like wondering, uh, what if I can't sleep? What's gonna happen? Am I gonna go crazy? Like how long is it gonna go on? What's tomorrow gonna be like? And those things, that's the break, right? So it's kind of like driving a car with both the gas and the brake in. It kind of, there is some sleep, but it's very fitful and, and it can all, often seem kind of bizarre. I call that hypersleep. And uh, commonly it's like very intense dreams. You're not even sure if you're awake or asleep or not. Uh, time seems to skip ahead. Um, and, and this one is common too. Like, which is like, I, I wake up and I, I feel like I must have slept for such a long time, but it was only a short period of time. And, and this, to me, the way I interpret this is that when you wake up and you're already hyper aroused, you're already so awake, then the interpretation from the brain means one of them, or the, yeah, one of the interpretations is like, I, to have, to feel this refreshed or like alert, I should say, I must have slept a really long time. And then it's kind of confusing when you're like, oh my gosh, it was only 15 minutes. How can I feel this awake after only 15 minutes? Something must be really wrong, but there's nothing strange. It's just that hyper arousal there. I think one more thing here is like, I think it's always helpful to ask yourself, how do I know it was 15 minutes, right? Because if you know, if you check the time, then that can be, you know, that, that can be something really that helps. Because if, if you don't, if you no longer check the time, if you no longer monitor how long you slept, if you no longer monitor how many times you woke up, if you no, no longer monitor, like, uh, if you use a tracker, if you like abandon that, that, that can be much easier for sleep to happen when the, there's not this monitoring and pressure. A very good analogy, or not even analogy, it's like a thought experiment rather, is if you take anyone who sleeps well and you, uh, you tell them, okay, I want you to show me how to fall asleep within five minutes, which you claim you can do, and I'm gonna stand here next to your bed in the white coat with a clipboard and a timer. And I'm gonna say one, two, three. And by the way, you're not allowed to wake up more than once tonight and you have to sleep more than nine hours, okay? One, two, three, go! That person is not gonna sleep well at all because they have all that self-monitoring and pressure that's there, right? And oftentimes, and you know, when you have insomnia, that pressure is internal, it comes from kind of self-monitoring like self-pressure and like that and abandoning tracking is a very helpful step away from that okay so uh andrew hope that helped and, and do stay in touch let us know how things go mackenzie writes i really need your help today now i went out saturday night and messed up my circadian clock didn't sleep at all saturday was exhausted all day sunday barely slept sunday not even sure for more than an hour last night didn't sleep at all how is my body doing this? I just don't get it. I feel like I'm never going to sleep again. Mackenzie, sorry, of course, to hear this happening, but uh, thanks for sending us this question. And, you know, I had, uh, uh, it was on a call, um, I think it was last week, this dropping classes that we do within the sleep coach school. And one of my clients said, I thought my head, I, yeah, I felt like my head was gonna explode. And the, the moment she said that, I realized that, you know, she knew that it wasn't going to explode. <laughs> we all know that our heads cannot explode. That cannot happen. Yet, it can feel like that. It can feel like I'm just, my head is just going to explode. It's a very real feeling, you know. And so, uh, it's, it's similar when we read from um, Mackenzie here that I, I feel like I'm never going to sleep again. I think we can, we, can, we can have the knowledge that that cannot happen. You know, just like our heads cannot explode, I can never sleep again. That cannot happen. It never happens. And and, um, and but at the same time, acknowledge the feeling that we can definitely have that fear. You know, because when when we have a fear like, what if I never fall asleep? What if I never sleep again? And we try to push that away. We like, but that if if we use the same example I use as a means of trying to push away that thought and say like. But that can happen. Daniel said it cannot happen. It's impossible. So go away. Don't don't send me that thought again. But what if you're different? What if you literally never sleep again? Stop. Go away. Then we have we have friction. So I think it's always helpful to like when you recognize the thought. What if I never sleep again? You can say like, okay, I, I hear the thought and I see that the brain is trying to keep me safe and and make me alerted to things that it's afraid of. Uh, I know that cannot happen, but I still hear the thought that that helps because the brain feels heard. Now, another thing that I think was helpful, it can be helpful to talk about here is the idea that you can uh, that you can sort of damage your 
circadian rhythm or your body clock, which you really cannot. Of course, it is true that if you if you are are up a whole night and then the following half of the following day and then you fall asleep midday and then you wake up at 2 a.m. and then you're like then your kind of sleep schedule is going to be like a little different but that doesn't mean anything is harmed or or, or, or different in, in, with your sleep with your internal clock or your circadian rhythm it's very very flexible so i think when things have gotten thrown off, then it's good to know that that's, I mean, it, it happens all the time, especially like, imagine if you travel from, you know, New Zealand to Scotland or something like that, you, you're going to adapt to that. So I think, you know, just seeing that nothing strange has happened and uh, some fear often causes trouble sleeping and that when you sleep well, it's because of less fear, et cetera, et cetera. And just going back to uh, having uh, maybe a more regular wake up time and not spending too much time in bed, but uh, enjoying your night and just doing the usual things that help. Uh, I think is, is really the way here. Um, uh, stay in touch, Mackenzie. Let us know how things go. Ellie's live with us and says, Hey, hi, Daniel. I was wondering, how can I learn to let go and start doing things I enjoy, but also get things done in life, like schoolwork? I find that I default myself to doing things purely for survival which I believe perpetuates insomnia anxiety and makes a uh, threat of wakefulness grow. Yeah, this is a great question. Or like, how can I let go, but still do things that I kind of need to, to do? And uh, the key to me here is you, you can do a lot of things in, in, a, in an unattached way. And um, I, I think my, my go-to example here is actually <laughs> Michael Jordan, because I watched this documentary and it really struck me that time. It's called, uh, what's it called? The Last Dance. It's a, it's a great documentary, especially if you're interested in it. Uh, but basically, if, if you imagine like, if you're an athlete, like a top athlete, you are going to want to win, right? And there's no question in my mind that Michael, ja Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan was super competitive. He wanted to win like nobody's business, right? But at the same time, he's like, why would I worry about a shot that I even had haven't even taken yet, you know. Meaning, there's you know you can want something really really much without being attached to the outcome. So you can you can want to to do things in life. Really, I really really want to do things in life, but still be unattached. Which means that, let's say uh, Ellie says here, I, I want to do things in life, and, and you imagine those things not happening. And if you see that, you know what, I want to do things in life, but if they don't happen, then that's okay. Then, then you're there. Like you're, 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 you're really like you want things, but you're unattached. The outcome, it's okay. Whatever happens, and that uh, you, you can see when you hear that as if like if if I was like unattached like that, I would never get things done. But that's not true. In fact, uh, I personally get a lot of things done, and I'm also very unattached to the outcome. You know. Uh, I, I would, I, I want to, um, reach more people, grow the YouTube channel, you know, grow the, the everything I want. I want that to grow. And I, I work hard. I work, I work a lot, but at the same time, if none of that happens, then what can I do? That's okay. So I think there's, uh, that's, that, that really helps that to know that you can want something without being attached to the outcome there. There's many ways this has been explained in other, uh, other teachings, but that's, that's how I do it. All right, so Elizabeth says, hi, Daniel. I'm an, I'm an 18 year old girl. Uh, I've been struggling with sleep problems for about two years. It'll be three years in November. Again, we have the insomnia birthday. I sleep, but not all my hours. I will spend like three weeks sleeping really bad. I'll get about three to five hours of sleep. And then I'll spend about two days or something, uh, even a, a week sleeping good. And I will get about seven to eight hours of sleep. Then I'll go back to sleeping bad. It drives me crazy. One of my problems is that I get scared of sleeping because I feel like something might happen to me. I know this might sound crazy, but I don't know. I just got this fear of sleeping out of nowhere. About a week ago, I read uh, about sleep deprivation and I read that someone can die from sleep deprivation. I don't know if that's true, but it scared me. Is it true? I feel like I might be, uh, I might be sleep deprived. I mean, I have to be like, it's going to be three years that I'm struggling with sleep problems. I feel tired through the day and I will go to bed to see if I can take a nap. But no matter how hard I try, I just can't fall asleep. Can you talk more about sleep deprivation? Do you have any tips on how I can stop being scared of sleep? Please. I really don't know what uh, to do. I need sleep. I think the last sentence here is, uh, you know, tells us a lot, which is basically, oh, Ellie says, thanks for the advice. Anytime, Ellie. Happy to help. Um, you know, 
it, it actually segues really nicely here because the same thing that we talked about just now with Ellie in Ellie's live question, which is you can you can want something without being attached to the outcome. Meaning, if uh, or I would say this way, myself and every other human being on the planet, I believe, want to sleep well. We all want to sleep well, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But it's the difference when we're really attached to the outcome. Meaning. If you feel like you need sleep, you gotta have it, you crave it, you, you you want it, you beg for it, you hope for it, you negotiate for it, you think that if you sleep, that means you're okay. If you don't sleep, that means you're broken, something is wrong with you, then you have attachment. And that's what we read here about like, I need sleep. That's like that attached, uh, that attachment again. And it's that attachment that creates the pressure and uh, tension and friction and like worry and preoccupation that creates insomnia. So I think one thing that's really helpful to know for anyone that is in um, Elizabeth's situation is that you can want to sleep without being attached to it. And just that awareness, you know, seeing yourself, seeing uh, those kind of attached thoughts, uh, that that alone is so helpful. Because when it happens, like, I got, I, I need sleep. You, you recognize the thought, like, aha, there's that attachment again. And that's actually what keeps me from sleeping, just recognizing that super, super helpful. And that was number one. Number two. Sleep deprivation is, is completely different from insomnia. Uh, a person who, let's say, they have two, they juggle two jobs and they have a, a toddler and a four-year-old and they're single, let's say a single parent, and they literally come, you know, they come home from work, you know, at 10 p.m. and the babysitter has let the kids sleep and, you know, the kids are awake till 1 a.m. and they have to be awake, uh, you know, at 5 a.m. to go to the job, like that person literally only has four hours for sleep. That's it. They only have four hours for sleep. And that person falls asleep immediately. They fall asleep right away and sleep solid for four hours. And then they have to fight to get up when the alarm clock sets. Sleep happens very, very, very easy for the sleep deprived person because they're sleep deprived, right? And which is very different from insomnia. With insomnia, it's like, I can't nap. And uh, no matter how much I try to sleep, I just can't sleep. Sleep doesn't happen to me. So very, very different. Now, what's so important is that neither one has been shown to cause any health problems whatsoever. Um, if anyone comes across any uh, type of article that says sleep deprivation causes this or that, or insomnia causes this or that, then you just know that it's not true because that it's impossible to show that. Because how can you take like 100,000 people and make them sleep deprived and take another 100,000 and make sure they're not sleep deprived and look at the outcome of that experiment has never been done, will never happen. And furthermore, when you look at like longitudinal studies, you see that people who have, well, in this case, insomnia, um, have just the same life expectancy as people who don't, like there's no difference. So uh, I think that's very helpful to know. Uh, now, uh, we have this, uh, um, Elizabeth describes this like, feast or famine or a bubble and bust uh, um, type of pattern, which is so common when you have some nights where you sleep more, some nights when you sleep less. And uh, I think, you know, naturally it seems like, okay, what am I doing right on the nights when I sleep uh, longer? And what do I do wrong when I sleep on nights to I, I sleep shorter? And how can I, you know, use that to kind of have more control or like make things more uh, even? That type of thinking is problem solving. And uh, that problem solving uh, creates more problems <laughs> when it comes to sleep, because when you're trying to look for something that prevents you from not sleeping or makes you sleep more, that just creates more struggle. So I think the best way to meet this pattern is, I call it the pendulum method. And you know how the pendulum goes from one side to the other? Well, you can meet that in, in a way that makes it kind of like the pendulum swing less and less. And, and it's just simply by attributing uh, sleep or lack of sleep or lo a little sleep to the true uh, reason for that happening. So let's say you um, you understand that sleep comes from nowhere uh, and uh, there's nothing required for sleep and it doesn't mean anything uh, that you slept little or a lot. And then you, you, you use that to your advantage. So you have um, a day where, or a morning, let's say, and you, you slept very little, you slept very little, then you go like, aha, Nothing strange or unusual. This was simply because I was a bit worried about sleep and maybe I tried to sleep. That's all. And then you have a night where you, or a morning after you slept uh, more and you slept uh, better. Then you go, okay, uh, nothing strange or unusual. Uh, I was just more willing to be awake. I was trying to sleep less. 
and sleep just happened a little bit easier that way. So you just meet, you learn from every night. Like, oh, I was just a little bit anxious. Oh, I was more willing to be awake. Just like that. You can meet, you can learn from every night like that and just reinforce to the brain, teach the brain that there's nothing it needs to do. It doesn't need to do any problem solving. It doesn't need to figure it out. It just needs to see that it's safe to be awake and, and, and allow sleep to happen by virtue of not being afraid. And, oh, yeah, yeah, I do want to comment on it. It can seem really strange that when you're like, you have this fear and you sort of like a phobia, um, you know, when we are afraid of spiders, when you have, or I should say when there's like uh, uh, arachnophobia, you, you logically know that spiders, generally speaking, cannot harm me, but I'm really, really scared of them. I can see that my, my the fear of them is out of proportion to how much they potentially could harm me. That's what we call a phobia. And it's really the same with insomnia. Insomnia is kind of a phobia of being awake. And, um, but in the case of being awake, like it literally cannot harm you, unlike spiders. But we have the same thing. It seems kind of like odd sometimes. We're like, what am I so afraid of? Why do I have this sense that something's going to happen to me? And by the way, what, what we're afraid is going to happen to us in the context of insomnia is being awake. It's literally like, I, I don't sleep because I'm afraid I'm going to become awake. And it's very intangible. You know, there's no, it's out of context. There's no real threat going on, but you feel really scared. And that gives rise to the sensation that what I'm, I'm scared of something. I think something's going to happen to me. I don't understand why, but when you see things clearly, you see that it's um, the fear of being awake. You're you're just scared that you'll be awake, and it's kind of intangible, so it can seem kind of strange. But uh, yeah, Elizabeth, hope hope this helps. Uh, and yes, yeah, stay in touch. Let us know how things go here. And then I think oh, we have two more, Daniel and Sean. So let's go over Daniel's comment. Here. Hi, Daniel. It's Daniel. <laughs> Uh, it's always funny when Daniel writes because it becomes this like, hi, Daniel, it's Daniel. Um, hope this message finds you well. It does. I'm struggling, struggling again after doing so well with sleep and the jerks for months seem to have hit a bump that has caused me to go down the rabbit hole again for the fourth time. Uh, I started medication for heartburn and I was awake one day. I couldn't sleep. Eyes were burning. So I immediately thought it was a meds uh, uh, like what happened back in December with the antibiotic. I really believed. This uh, is all in my mind. Just can't escape it for more than a few months at a time. Also started back drinking alcohol just to sleep, which was starting the jerks back. Uh, and advice, please, I always get better when we chat. Daniel, you give me courage and hope, and everything you say is true. Just keep hitting these bumps on the road. Thanks, Daniel, from a friend who thinks you often. Daniel, thanks so much for all the support. You know, I really appreciate it. And, um, and I think you know you know everything, but it can help to kind of hear it again, which is that this is remarkable. I mean, it's remarkable that you've gone months without the jerk sleeping well, et cetera. And that doesn't happen randomly. That comes from uh, being willing to look inside, being willing to see that, you know, it was my resistance, my unwillingness to be awake and to have un discomfort in my life. That unwillingness, the resistance was actually that what caused the, the struggle, right? Which is not easy to see. You know, we often don't want to see that because it's it's kind of that in itself is uncomfortable. But you know, you you uh, have been willing to see that, Daniel, which is amazing, and you've had courage to like let let things be and let go of control. Amazing. That's led you to you know not having these jerks, etc. And um, and then you know you take a new medication, and of course there can be some residual fear in the brain. Even after months, there can be it happens. Like it's totally normal. And then you have a couple of nights where you don't sleep much at all, and some of the fear pattern comes back. It's totally normal. And uh, you know you go back to drinking alcohol to try to make yourself sleep. But you see that you see that's an effort. You see that's not helpful. So if you know that in itself is gonna is gonna be self limiting. So I think uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all by by the time I record this video, you probably have already already seen all this, and and you're you know you're, you're back to uh, a place of peace again. But I think uh, Daniel, that the the one thing to add there is that you've had like I think you said this has been like the fourth speed bump, but it's been months since the last one. And you may very well have a couple of more speed bumps, but with every one that every speed bump you have, and then you, you see that oh sleep comes back again for the simple reason that I don't really respond to it and I don't go down the rabbit hole. Super helpful. And you know, anyone that's understands the rabbit hole and has seen it will never go back there. You know, even if sometimes it seems like you can go back to a place where you're just like 
scrambling on the internet, Googling, trying to find the cure and trying supplements and medications and, and uh, gadgets and all these things. But once you know that that is what causes you to have a struggle, you simply don't go there, right? So uh, speed bumps are totally normal. Hang in the Daniel and let us know how things go. And thanks as always for all the support. All right, Sean, this is the last message for today. Let's read this. Hello, Daniel. First off, thanks for all the great information and videos. You got it. I'll try to keep this short, or you can cut some parts if you plan to do a video on it. I've had sleeping problems since high school, and I'm now 42. I tried every sleeping pill you can think of, and even doctors prescribed pills that only made matters worse. When I was young, the sleeping problems were not all that often. I would have a bad night, not worry about it. I would get back to normal sleep patterns in the next couple of days. I had nights so no sleep maybe once every year or once every six months. Once again, I didn't pay much attention to them, and the things went back to normal. The last six months, things have taken a turn for the worse. The icing on the cake. It started in January, where I started having no sleep nights once every couple of weeks. I also drank alcohol on those nights and feel that added to the problem. Then in mid-Feb, it was once uh, it was once a week of nights with no sleep. Then March, April was two nights every week with no sleep. The worst week so far was at the end of May. When I had three nights of no sleep, I've tried all sorts of things, such as diet changes, breathing exercises, food that makes you sleep, etc. But in mid-June, I had enough. I decided it was time to see a local psychologist and start using CBTI. I started CBTI on 6-30-21. My next session is 7-23. Uh, that was actually last week or something. This week, I started sleep restriction 1 a.m. to 6-30 p.m. Now doing CBTI. I've screwed up a couple of times. I decided to have a couple of drinks, drinking nights. I didn't drink too much, but I know I was, and it was enough to screw up my sleep pattern. I was hungover the next day. I decided to stop drinking since my health is far more important. My question is, did the drinking during CBTI set me back? Did my one night of fun cause me weeks worth of sleep problems? Another question is, I didn't sleep last night, even though I was nodding off watching TV before bedtime. Once in bed, I was awake and I didn't get mad because I know that only adds to the problem. I'm so exhausted right now that I know if I laid in bed, I would fall asleep. I was told not to take naps, but now I have to stay up until the 1 a.m. I'm not sure I can do that without a nap. I am that tired. I'm hoping that the removal of alcohol and falling CBTI will help me get back to normal sleep. Scheduled right now, I've seen, uh, right now I've seen some improvement, but I still have a long way to go. Thank you for your time, Sean. Anytime, Sean. I'm so glad you're here. And, you know, um, really, this channel is a good is here for for everyone right that has sent messages but particularly in, in your case john I, I feel um I'm, I'm so glad you're here because you you did um what you know what what you we're always told is like the right thing to do which is like cbti right that's kind of the gold standard the thing and you know what there's so many problems with cbti honestly like there are so many problems with it Anyway, let's get to that in a second. Let's just review some things first, which is I often have clients that tell me that uh, uh, they would ask like, oh, how long have you trouble sleeping? And they say like, oh, it's been two weeks. And I'm like, oh, that's not so long. Like maybe you don't even need to be in this program, you know, like, uh, and then they go, oh, no, no, it's been really intense for two weeks. But in fact, it's been going on for years, right? And then uh, it, it turns out that similar to, to Sean here, uh, there's been this kind of on and off of things going on with sleep for many years, you know, one sleepless night per year or six months, and then kind of like a little trouble here and there, but uh, but not too much. And, and the thing that is so confusing often is that it seems like I had this problem within me, but it wasn't very active, and now it has become more active, you know, where in reality is there's always like all of us humans have sleepless nights, myself included, I mean, not, not that I sleep zero hours, but oftentimes I sleep maybe three hours, you know, maybe once every, I don't know how often actually, but not, not unoffen, right? It happens to all of us. And it happened to Sean. But, uh, but long time ago, this didn't trigger any type of response. You know, it was like, I didn't worry much about it. And then, and that was, that was it. So, but it, it can seem like, it was so mild that I didn't need to worry about it, but in reality it's like, I didn't worry much about it and therefore it was mild, right? And 
and at some point this kind of changed though at some point there was a little bit more preoccupation around it for some reason maybe there was some more stress at life during life and now the brain started to be like maybe this is the problem and then what happens is what i call priming which is this kind of like for example someone says like i had trouble for years but I, I was able to manage it with just with melatonin which means that this person has started to think that there's something wrong inside me i have some kind of problem but i can keep my, myself safe using melatonin for example which actually is is just a way of like priming the brain to start to to believe more and more that there is some kind of threat because you're doing something you're doing something to escape being awake by for example taking melatonin or changing your sleep hygiene or whatever it is and by doing something to keep you safe you're teaching the brain there is a real threat and this kind of priming often can have been happening for years until it starts becoming like it, there's some more stress and now the brain thinks oh my gosh th th i didn't sleep at all last night this is really a problem this is really a threat which is again like it's built up by all this priming over the years and now it becomes more like full-blown because like now the brain is like the safety alarm in the brain and the brain is a survival machine and you know it always wants to keep you safe so that when it thinks something is wrong it's kind of like starts going the alarms start going off and when the alarms start going off, you sleep less, and then the alarms go off even more, and, and then et cetera. And then you find yourself in this real struggle, right? So I think this is just to kind of normalize or like or 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 introduce this concept of priming, which can under which can um which explains why things can suddenly get they can suddenly be so much more struggle, or over time they can kind of be this escalation of struggle, right? Which there, there was actually priming going on before that. So it's it normalizes that. Now, um, and now then Sean um, goes to start CBTI. And the problem with CBTI is, to be, to be honest with everyone here, I, I think it's, it's this implied controllability, which is that, okay, if you just stay up until 1 a.m. and you get up no later than 6.30, then you're going to have like such a strong sleep drive. You're going to be so sleepy at 1 a.m. that it's just going to make you sleep. It's going to make you sleep. And then when you're sleeping, then you can kind of like slowly, gently, like increase the sleep window until you reach whatever time period you want to sleep, which never, it, it just doesn't work like that in real life. Because when you're making yourself stay up late, that's just another way to try to control sleep. And whenever you try to control sleep, it creates so much preoccupation, anxiety, worry, and like all these thoughts that keeps sleep from happening. I think traditional CBTI is kind of like roulette. Like you're kind of, you're kind of like, you know, playing roulette with your emotions in your sleep in a way. Sure, there are some people who say like CBTI was great for me. To me, they're lucky. To me, they're the lucky outliers who, who just, they believe in their therapist. They believe in the therapy to an extent where they started seeing, uh, to start with like, they stay up till, for example, 1 a.m. and then they fell asleep. Not because they stayed up till 1 a.m. and were sleepy, but because they believed in this. Like they were like, this is gonna work for me. And then they slept and then they forgot about the struggle and they they, they became kind of more, you know, yeah, they were just lucky, right? But oftentimes, I would say probably the majority of the time, it's more like Sean's story that there's just more pressure to sleep, more focus on control, more tracking hours, more like, more obsessing about sleep that comes from this traditional CBTI approach. So anyone that's tried traditional CBTI and it wasn't helpful, totally normal, nothing strange or unusual about that. It's that implied controllability problem that exists within traditional CBTI teaching. Now, uh, so what should you do then? What's my idea? Well, my idea, I talked about this fairly recently, but uh, anyone interested can check out that this is not a playlist in the description of any new video. I talk about the timeless sleep window, which can seem like sleep restriction, but it's completely opposite. So my approach would be something like, let's say, yeah, get up maybe around 6.30 a.m. That's helpful to, to get up about the same time every morning. Not to like start creating sleep drive right away, not at all. It is just to take a step away from chasing sleep. Oftentimes when you, you have trouble sleeping, you have a night where you sleep little, the alarm goes off at 6.30, let's say, and you're like, but I just fell asleep literally like an hour ago. I have to get some more sleep. Let me try to get some more. That's chasing sleep. And when you, whenever you're chasing sleep, try and get more of it, it becomes more and more elusive. So if you get up about the same time every morning, especially when you're like, I need to get some more sleep, but wait a minute, 
if I am laying here to try to get more sleep, I'm going to teach the brain that I have to chase sleep, which is why I have insomnia. So maybe I should get up, you know. And on the flip side, if you if you wake up and you're like, I think I just want to sleep some more. I'm not even chasing sleep. If I don't sleep more, that's totally fine too. But I think I want to snooze a little bit. That's totally fine. It's the chasing sleep that we move away from when we decide to get up about the same time every morning. So let's say you get up about 6.30, but then you say, okay, instead of forcing myself to stay up till 1 a.m., I'm just going to stop checking what time it is at 11, for example, right? I just stop checking what time it is at 11. And if I feel like it's time to go to bed and rest or sleep, I can do that. If I feel like doing something else uh, that is nice, enjoyable, meaningful to me, that's fine. So you have this period during the night that is uh, that is timeless and you allow sleep to happen if it happens. And if not, then you do something that's meaningful to you. And you don't know how much you slept or you don't keep track of that. That That's really helpful. And, um, uh, oh, yeah, the alcohol question, you know, uh, the only thing that really can cause insomnia. So the way I define insomnia is like, to me, insomnia is when the fear of being awake, when the fear of I can't sleep or not sleeping, when the fear of being awake uh, leads you to have a lot of struggles, that's insomnia to me. And so the way I define it, there's only one thing in the universe that can cause insomnia, and that is the fear of being awake. And alcohol has nothing to do with that. So, of course, if you if you drank a lot and it, it disrupted your sleep and you think, oh, my gosh, I've destroyed my sleep by drinking, then you have fear of being awake, which can go on for a long time. But that has nothing to do with alcohol. It's about thoughts. And um, similarly, when, you know, you start the CBTI program and you have, you know, one day where you kind of do something that's not in program, like, and people very often ask, like, have I destroyed all the progress I've made over the past few weeks? Of course not. <laughs> Absolutely not. There's really nothing to destroy because we don't need to do anything to sleep, right? And, and the things you've learned, education, you can't, like, destroy that. It just doesn't go away. So um, I, I want to put it this way, that it is the idea that I've destroyed my sleep by doing this, the judgment, the self-criticism, that can create some struggle. But the actual thing you did is, is like small potato. It doesn't matter. And by the way, when we avoid things to accommodate, like when we avoid things to, to protect sleep, then that generally leads to more trouble. So I would say if someone has been uh, sort of like using alcohol as a sleep aid, I've been trying to make myself sleep by drinking alcohol, then it can be really helpful to not drink alcohol it's it's a step away from trying to control sleep or force sleep on the flip side when somebody's like i used to have a beer at night or a, a glass of wine with dinner but i don't think i should do that because it might I mess up my sleep uh that's a different territory that's like again you're, you're trying to control sleep by avoiding something it's an avoidance sleep effort and so in those situations i think it's most helpful to do what you feel, what you want to do, regardless of how it will affect your sleep. You know, uh, just live your life in like a free manner, you know, from a place of abundance and without fear. That really helps. All right. So finally, we have a live question from Zipperial, uh, who says, "Can you help me?" Well, I want to say, if you have trouble sleeping, then I can definitely offer a lot of education here that can help. I mean, ultimately, it's always like. Nobody can make you sleep or, or make you learn, but um, someone like myself can can point in the right direction or in the most helpful direction, I should say. You know, I'm trying to avoid like right or wrong, like dualism thing, but in the most helpful direction, um, definitely, 100%. So yeah, with that said, I wanna thank everyone for submitting questions here. Thank you so, so much. Um, if you hear this and you're like, I like this teaching, it makes sense to me. But I would like a little bit more guidance and support than I can find here in these free videos on the YouTube channel. Then uh, feel free to check out uh, thesleepcoachschool.com, a website. And um, you can see how you can work with myself uh, using an app if you like uh, text-based coaching. Or you can join our Insomnia Immunity Program, which is a web-based program. So feel free to check those out. And uh, Nadia, thanks so much. As I said in the beginning of this broadcast, I'm thinking of ways to... Uh, you know, make sure I can answer every single question in a more timely manner, but I haven't figured it out quite yet, but 
I will. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much for tuning in and uh, hope to have you back here real soon. Bye now.